Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Good afternoon to most of the country. Uh, for those in the West that might be thinking about jumping out for an early lunch, well, you're not going to want to miss today's edition of the Green Builder Media's Impact Series, Game Changers in Sustainability, because today's presentation features internationally renowned nature photographer Art Wolf. Now, today's webinar would not be possible without the support of our generous sponsors, and those sponsors are BASF. BASF is a leader in the construction industry. With more than 600 products serving 75 construction product categories, BASF offers the broadest portfolio of products used directly on construction sites or integrated into other products to improve the performance of construction projects. BASF is also a global leader in sustainability and corporate social responsibility, committed to constant improvements in safety, protection of health, and environmental conservation. Bio-based insulation. A bio-based insulation spray polyurethane products help to lessen the environmental impact of residential and commercial structures by sealing and insulating in one step. Bio-based insulation integrates rapidly renewable ingredients as replacement for a portion of the petroleum in many of their insulation products without hindering performance and has replaced chemical blowing agents with water. DuPont. DuPont puts science to work by creating sustainable solutions essential to a better, safer, healthier life for people everywhere. DuPont is focused on dynamic science that generates real-world solutions. That's why DuPont is at the forefront of building science with brands you depend on, like Tyvek, Sentryglass, Corian Solid Surfaces, Zodiac Quartz Services, and Kevlar. Green Builder Coalition. The Green Builder Coalition amplifies the voice of green builders and professionals to drive advocacy and education for more sustainable building practices. For more information, log on to greenbuildercoalition.org. And Upanor. Upanor is a worldwide supplier of radiant heating and cooling, plumbing, and fire sprinkler systems that provide energy and water efficiency to homes and businesses around the globe. To learn more, please visit www upanor-usa.com. I'm Mike Kalignan. I'm Executive Director of the Green Builder Coalition, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Now, I hope that during the course of today's presentation, you'll submit questions for our guest. Now, to do so, simply use the small box at the bottom of the q and I'll review those questions and pose them to Art during the Q&A time set aside near the end of our webcast. And now to introduce today's speaker. During the, over the course of his 30-year career, photographer Art Wolf has worked on every continent in hundreds of locations. His stunning images interpret and record, record <clears throat> the world's fast disappearing wildlife, landscapes, and native cultures, and are a lasting inspiration to those who seek to preserve them all. Wolf has taken an estimated 1 million images in his lifetime and has released over 60 books as well as numerous children's titles. Art is an honorary fellow of the Royal Photographic Society and a fellow of the International League of Conservation Photographers. He has captured numerous publishing awards and is the proud recipient of the Photographic Society of America's Progress Medal. He earned a coveted Alfred Eisenstead Magazine Photography Award and was named Outstanding Nature Photographer of the Year by the North American Nature Photography Association. The National Audubon Society recognized Wolf's work in support of the National Wildlife Refuge System with its first ever Rachel Carson Award. Wolf has also ventured into the world of television production with On Location with Art Wolf, Techniques of the Masters, and as host of American Photos Safari, which aired on ESPN from 1993 to 1995. In May 2007, Art made his public television debut with Art Wolf's Travels to the Edge an intimate and upbeat series that offers unique insights on nature, culture, and the new realm of digital photography. The first season garnered American Public Television's Programming Excellence Award, which was unprecedented for a first season show. The second season garnered five Silver Telly Awards for Outstanding Achievement. The show has been broadcast in more than, more than 180,000 times in the U.S. alone and is now seen in syndication throughout the world. And for more information about Art and his work, you can visit his website at www.artwolf.com. 
Today's moderator is the widely recognized Ron Jones, president of Green Builder Media and board chairman and co-founder of the Green Builder Coalition. Ron, I, hand, I confidently hand the proceedings over to you, sir. Thank you, Mike. I, I am really excited and honored uh, to welcome Art Wolf to the Impact Series. I have, uh, I have been a fan of Art's uh, work for a very long time, and, and I can tell you that any time that I'm at home and, and uh, near the television set, I, I don't miss an episode of Travels to the Edge. Art, it's really a pleasure to have you here, and uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, talking with you and hearing your thoughts about the uh, fast-changing world that we live in and uh, to hear your message. Thanks, Ron. I'm really happy to be here w with you this morning. Let's start off by um, talking a little bit about uh, your uh, impressions of the world today in, in, in terms of how the world is, is changing. I know that you and I have talked a little bit about, um, you know, your reflections on, uh, let's say, traditional cultures that exist in the world in in contrast to, you know, the everyday world that we all experience. Could you expand a little bit on that for us? Well, you know, I, I, the more I talk around the world and uh, across our country, I've realized now that after 40 years of world travel that I have a pretty broad base of knowledge of wildlife, of landscapes, of native cultures. Um, I, I, I think that I'm not the only one, but certainly I've accrued a lot of uh, wisdom and knowledge about how different cultures live around the world. I've seen, you know, glaciers recede. I've seen uh, remote cultures be influenced by Western creep of civilization. I've seen, you know, the most stunning wildlife on every uh, continent over the last 40 years. So I, I think I'm speaking uh, from a broad base. and. Um, so I, I, I think I'm going to be enjoying our conversation today. Uh, one of the things I think we uh, discussed last week when we uh, had a pre preliminary discussion was the fact that a lot of the remote cultures that I've visited over the last uh, um, period of years have basically been living a green builder's uh, ethic. You know, in other words, they long before the Western civilization kind of caught on, they were living well within their means and every environment I've encountered them, largely for survival. If they were out of whack, if they were, you know, imbalanced uh, with their traditions, they would simply go away. And I've prepared a little bit of a, a slideshow to show some of these distinctly different environments as we progress in our conversation this morning. Excellent. Well, um, you have an intriguing uh, image that you're starting off with, so I'm yeah. going to let you just go ahead and, and, and give us a little guidance uh, through this tour. I, I, I have to share with our uh, visitors today that uh, just when we, when we connected right before we went live, I, I was teasing uh, Art that uh, there's an old saying that the only difference between men and boys is the size of their toys. And it looks like this one would be a lot of fun to have in the driveway. Yeah, you know, there's context to everything. And um, I just thought I would give a synopsis of, of how I began. I, I, was, I grew up in the wooded ravines and uh, out on the outskirts of Seattle in the 50s and the 60s. And so oh, Seattle is home base, and I virtually live one mile from where I was born. Though I travel uh, probably eight months out of the year, it's, I'm like a homing pigeon coming back to Seattle. And uh, in 1984, I was fortunate enough to um, go to Mount Everest, um, be invited into Tibet with a team of Boeing engineers, which were my climbing friends, and we attempted the northeast ridge of Mount Everest. Upon my return, I uh, bought an old house in West Seattle that was uh, covered in ivy. It was a it was constructed in 1910, and it was it, it was at that point in my life it was I was ready to move into a home 
and I wondered whether I should move out to the country, which I really love, the mountains, the foothills, or stay within the city and make that my home. So I chose an old house in West Seattle and uh, tore out the ivy for the first eight months, and then I started bringing in this huge crane. And the crane uh, was intended to place rocks because on my way back from Mount Everest, I stopped at a place in eastern China called Huanshan, and it was uh, absolutely transformational for me to go to this amazing landscape of granite rocks and twisted pine trees. And what I wanted to do then was to build this uh, garden attached to this old house. And you can see the crane was uh, intended to place 12-ton rocks throughout this garden as I was going to embark for the next 30 years to build a, a garden that was uh, accompanying this great old house. So you can see the crane. The neighbors thought, oh my god, who's moved into the neighborhood? They would bring out lawn chairs and watch this whole uh, happening. And over the years, as you can see, the gardens matured, the mosses have filled in, and I've brought in 100 tons of granite. I've brought in uh, about 15 old Japanese pines, which I work on every year. And this is a great uh, thing that I've done for myself because I spend an inordinate amount of time strapped to plane seats. And to come back to the garden after uh, traveling home for 48 hours, get into uh, an environment that is uh, filled with the things that I draw upon when I'm out photographing around the world, textures, patterns, water, all those elements I've surrounded myself now. Uh, and what I didn't really think would be uh, an addition with the fact that with the water feature that I put in, a recycling uh, series of waterfalls, the wildlife is drawn to the garden. And so raccoons and herons, fox, coyotes, eagles, owls, they all are drawn to the garden. And as you approach this old house, which I unearthed under the ivy, uh, it's, it sits atop a bluff overlooking Puget Sound, the mountains. And so I've made um, a great place to live. And it wasn't an expensive house in 1986 when I bought it, but I've made it into a great, uh, great place to, to live. And I would argue that I have an Asian aesthetic. I, I love going to Japan. I love going to the Far East, and you know their aesthetic with nature is very much an influence to me. And so I can look from my garden out into, or from my house out into the garden. Virtually every view from my house has a view to the mountains or the trees that surround the house. And over the years, I kept refinancing and uh, adding to this old house so that I have great views. And I fill the house with things that I've collected from my world travel. So from Raku to uh, baskets, tapestries, carvings from New Guinea to Africa, I basically live a lifestyle that absolutely living that, that way. I, I've kind of lost my track. But at any rate, that was my house. Now I want to talk about where I go to. And uh, I've just been so fortunate over the years to have traveled from the most remote uh, cultures of the Amazon, one of which you're looking at a Yanomamo village, which is an entire village made in one structure. And so as this aerial view would show you, there's probably 12 to 15 families that live in a single structure. And why I bring this to our attention is the fact that these are hunter-gatherers, and they, uh, they're they constantly relocating this village. They'll live there about five or six years. They'll hunt and uh, hunt the forest. And when they sense that the, they've put a, a a stress to the environment, they'll simply relocate across the forest and allow this environment to grow back, the animals to return. And so they have this kind of migratory, over a period of years, they move through the forest, never exhausting it to the point where it can't recover. And so in many ways, it's just a, a great example of how people have adapted to an environment. And within that uh, structure, you can see how several families just kind of live in, and they'll have maybe eight different 
fire pits from which they share. Jump in and ask any questions as you wish, uh, Ron. This is really uh, interesting, and I, I love the symbolism of, of your own personal house and garden, uh, which, which is incredible, by the way. I had not seen these images. And, and the fact that, you know, you, uh, in, in a way, embody the same sort of, of natural instinct that um, the indigenous peoples uh, that you're uh, showing us have, and, and that is that, that protection of your environment as well as understanding its limitations. Um, tell us some more ab ab about these uh, fascinating folks here. Yeah, well, this is just a close-up of the Yanomamo tribe, and as I say, it's one of the few hunting, gathering uh, cultures left intact on the planet, and they're very much protected by the Venezuelan, the Colombian, and the Brazilian government because their uh, their range really extends over the borders of all three of these countries. So uh, uh, you'd have to have special permit to go into a culture like this. Uh, the governments are realizing the value of having these intact uh, indigenous cultures, and so uh, they're very, very uh, vulnerable to the Western civilization and also the illnesses that Western people can bring in. So before you could even get in there, you would need to be inoculated for everything you can imagine and remain healthy before they allow you to come in. So sure. I, I got a permission to go in there about uh, 15 years ago when I was working on a book entitled Tribes. And so let's talk a little bit about um, their relationship in, in terms of their built environment, which uh, obviously they have a, a finite set of resources that, that they work with and different materials to choose from, but they also have a, a unique set of environmental conditions. I assume that uh, heat is not, uh, or needing warmth is not an issue for them, uh, but uh, certainly uh, there would be periods of uh, intense precipitation and, uh, and, and then um, a very warm climate and so forth, um, and, and they've adapted their, their built environment accordingly. Um, do they uh, actually take these materials and, and take them with them to the next location, or at least part of them, or, or do they start from scratch when they, when they create a new village? I would imagine, and I, I'm only speaking from little knowledge about the longevity, um, you know, when I go into a culture, I'm not exhaustedly studying their, you know, 20 years looking back in time. I've got an agenda to go in there to get my job done and to move on a week later. I would suspect, however, that given the amount of distance that they would travel to the next environment, they physically would just let go of this let it uh, rot, and in a, in a rainforest environment, the forest reclaims uh, this really quick. And so I think that they probably would move at least 20 miles through the rainforest to the next location. And they'll bring their, their belongings, but I'm, I'm almost assured that most of this building would just uh, disintegrate and go back into the forest. Very interesting. So primarily they would be driven by a search for food and I assume uh, to some extent for fuel for their fires then. Exactly. And the fuel for the fire is very easy. The food is a, 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 a more of a challenge. They've got little hunting dogs, and it was a remarkable to watch the hunters would go out and the dogs would uh, circle wild game, small deer that live in the forest, and herd them back towards the hunters that would use bow and arrow. Again, this is a culture that uh, is unique in the rainforest. A lot of the other cultures cultivate yams and have become, you know, almost agriculturalists. But hunter gatherers are are wary little people that really are fierce, that usually are in fights with uh, tribes over the next ridge. So they're, it's, it's an aggressive culture and it's a unique culture in that regard. And they're pretty much hunting anything in the forest that they'll use for food and um, they will, they'll have skins and feathers kind of hanging in their village, and there's a lot of uh, attachment to um, shamans and spirits, and they keep the spirits of the animals that they've hunted. They revere the animals they they hunt, and it's 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 just 
you know, they view themselves as parts, part of nature and nothing separate, and that's how they live. Probably the most salient point of, of the entire uh, message. Yeah. Uh, the fact so I'm going to move through because there's, uh, and here's a view of them. Uh, and I have a lot of respect for their abilities. They've got uh, very large bowls and very long uh, arrows. And they use uh, the mucus of poison arrow frogs on the tip of their uh, point, and that is a poison that will knock a monkey out of a tree, uh, and it will die very quickly from that. I guess it would also... This, uh, as I say, you know, you hear about these things, but until you're with them, uh, it's it all comes, uh, it becomes very real when you are staying with them. Now, in a very, very different environment is the Mongolian steppe. It's a, uh, a large open landscape. It's one of the least populated countries on the planet. And most of the people that live in Mongolia live in the capital of Ulaanbaatar. So you've got this open steppe without fences, very few roads. And the people that live out there live uh, on the horses. You can recall Genghis Khan. He cultivated horses from the wild horses. And very much uh, this tradition survives. How the people live out there are in uh, yurts, which are homes made out of uh, kind of a structure of very thin wood, probably made from aspen or birch, and then uh, fabric and skins that kind of envelop the building. And again, it's a transitory life. They'll move according to forage for their goats and uh, yaks. And so this structure easily will be broken down and relocated as they follow the grass land and the forage. They certainly have a fabulous uh, environment in which to, to operate there. Do they, do they cultivate uh, crops as well as uh, they're herding or are they uh, primarily herders? They're entirely herders. There's no crops that I could see. This is a view from within. Uh, one of the things that, uh, and in the West, there's Kazakh people that uh, are right over the border from Kazakhstan, and these people uh, augment their lifestyle by raising golden eagles from which they'll hunt fox and wolves during the winter with these golden eagles, and the, the fur that they gain from the hunting, they will incorporate into their dress during the really uh, long, cold winters. Well, speaking of that, you know, because this is vastly different climate from the uh, the previous uh, peoples that we were uh, treated to, um, so how comfortable, I, I assume that they have a, a very uh, satisfactory level of comfort in the uh, yurts. You know, as we travel across this vast land, uh, we can uh, drive up to a yurt and the people just are... Uh, more than likely going to invite us in for a cup of tea and food, and we may give them a little bit of money to stay with them, and they will allow us to sleep on the mattresses on the floor. They have a fire uh, in the middle of the room that goes straight up uh, through an opening in the yurt, and they can close that off if it's pouring rain or snowing. And they've also got a chimney that they can erect. So. Uh, it's a very comfortable. If it can be blowing wind and cold outside, and once you're inside, it's toasty warm. And and their and their um, fuel of choice. Uh, they'll burn yak dung. They'll burn uh, basically whatever comes out of the animals that they herd. Base. You know, there's very few forests there, and they may have a little kerosene that they could buy from some of the villages. But for the most part, it's burning yak dung. And then uh, is that same fire used for cooking, or is that done outdoors? Absolutely. Oh. Yeah, they they cook on a little stove. And what? they'll make yak butter tea and uh, they'll uh, and meat from the goats that they uh, butcher and milk from, you know. Uh, so it's pretty self-sustaining. Do you have an idea about, you know, what is the home range for a, a, a group of these uh, people? It's vast. I mean, I'm sure, uh, I mean, if you look over Mongolia, it, it, there's not that, you know, we're not talking tens of thousands of herders. We're talking thousands of herders, and they just spread out a vast area. So uh, I could probably throw out a number, but I wouldn't be assured of it. But certainly, you know, a, a range for a family could be 20 square miles. Very interesting. 
Yeah, it's big. You know, and it's I've encountered quite a few Mon Montanan people that visit Mongolia because they love to ride horses. And when you think about it, there's no fences. And so that free spirit is very reminiscent of what the American West would have been like, you know, prior to um, civilization. So, prior so let me to ask you this, Western this, civilization, I should say. You know, I, I, I'm going to um, tap a little bit in, into your thought process here. When you, when you visit um, um, these kinds of, of uh, societies, uh, what, what is in your mind the comparison then with Western civilization or, um, you know, the, the advanced modern world in terms of the relationship with, with nature and with uh, the resources that we have? And, and, and are you, you know, I've never heard you uh, uh, say anything that was negative or, or depressed. Uh, uh, about the condition of our ecosystems and so forth, and I admire you for that. Um, but I wonder, you know, do you do you have the serious concerns when you when you look at the future for uh, people like these as well as for the rest of us? Well, I, you know, my main drive is to document as many cultures as I can, wildlife as I can. Uh, while they're intact and while the animals are there. I think that there's a lot of great organizations that are working on behalf of, uh, of indigenous cultures, on behalf of the environment. Uh, I support them. And um, I think it also is inevitable that a lot of these cultures will be uh, eroded with Western civilization. People like TV. They like radio. Uh, they like cell phones, and as soon as a new technology is introduced, I'm stunned at how fast it's brought into these remote cultures. Uh, you know, I can be anywhere in China or India, and they'll pick up, uh, they'll pull out a cell phone and call whomever. Where I still struggle with a cell phone in West Seattle to talk to my office. <laughs> so, you know, there's the advancements are embraced really quickly but they also have very strong pride in their traditions. I think Bhutan is an example, and I'll have some photos of Bhutan in a few moments, where the former kings of Bhutan, which it just be reverted into a democratic country about four years ago, but still very much influenced by the king. And the king put a great emphasis on natural environment and traditional cultures. And they believe that they can adapt Western civil, you know, the best of what Western civilization has to offer while still retaining um, their core beliefs in traditional values. Very important. So I, you know, I see the planet, I see changes in the planet. I see, you know, glaciers are disappearing at a, an alarming rate. And, you know, you can, I could basically, um, go crazy worrying about the future or I can contribute what I can contribute. And no, nobody really knows where the planet is heading in terms of uh, change on a clim climatic basis. But I can tell you there will be great changes in our lifetimes and uh, it's primarily centered around the climate change, the warming of the earth. I mean, it's just going to profoundly affect every aspect of our lives and every aspect of everybody's lives around the planet. Now, whether it, we have, I, I mean, I have a lot of hope that humans have the capacity to adapt and to change. And I've seen great advancements around the world in terms of um, reclaiming water that's been uh, damaged, you know, by bad practices. I see a lot more. Um, uh, solar panels in places I would never have expected it. So I think that, you know, people are making the changes that they can, and there will be a lot more uh, along the way. You said it, and I agree. I, I tend to look with uh, a positive attitude as opposed to a pessimistic attitude. I think that really shows in your work. Well, uh, please uh, continue along this nice tour. Okay. So uh, in Mongolia, upon the border, by the way, when I'm advancing, I'm seeing my photos abridged. I'm assuming the audience can see the entirety of the image. Am I correct on that, or maybe not? I hope so. 
Anyway, these, uh, it's interesting to me when I uh, travel by horse up into the re remote mountains that separate Siberia with northern Mongolia that we encountered the Satin people, and Satin means reindeer. So it's the reindeer people that live at elevation on this mountain range. They live in, um, in homes that are very, uh, and obviously connected to the plains uh, nations of North America, and in fact, everybody really realizes that most of the First Nations people in North America really came through different waves from Asia over the Bering Land Bridge, and along, uh, so when you look backward into Asia, you see many, many of the connections to North America, one of which are the teepees that the Satin people live in. And so we went up there and stayed with these people uh, with part of the TV show. And what was first uh, pretty dramatic was the fact that the Satin people raise reindeer, herd the reindeer wildly, but they also have cultivated and have developed a tradition of riding the reindeer. The reindeer uh, are very curious animals. They'll come into the the teepees of the Satin people, and, and you can see in this wide-angle view. I, I photograph these shots, by the way, not to have a future talk uh, with you, but I'm just pulling these out of the archive, and so you can see that stove in the middle that would go up to the point of the TB, T, uh, teepee. And we stayed in one of these, and, uh, and when we were having tea with the people, a reindeer came in, and uh, it was almost analogous to a pet. They also have dogs, but you can see how they ride the reindeer across this really Spartan mountain environment. They raise their reindeer above um, the bug line, in other words, above where mosquitoes uh, live. And so it's a cold environment. And, it, and, and again, tw a nod towards the future, you wonder how they're going to be able to survive because as uh, the environment is warming, mosquitoes go up the slope. And they're, you know, virtually they're running out of habitat to raise these reindeer without the influence of mosquitoes, which really torment the animals uh, greatly. They may have to move out of Mongolia and go further and further north into Siberia uh, in the Soviet Union. Fascinating. Here we go. We're now in Bhutan, and Bhutan is one of my favorite uh, countries to go. And I frequently will lead photo uh, tours into these places I'm showing you. Bhutan's one of my favorite places to lead a tour because so much of the traditional culture is right there. In neighboring Nepal, you would see tractors all across the landscape. But here in Bhutan, the, the people basically hand till the, uh, the landscape. You can see uh, in the distance the homes that they've built. And that, uh, again and again and again, wherever I've traveled throughout the world, it's interesting how the uh, people through thousands of years of evolution have basically built structures that are perfectly suited for their environment. And here at elevation in the Himalayas, uh, the homes almost are reminiscent of the styles you would find in the Alps, you know, very well built, very sturdy structures and homes often um, with rocks atop to keep the, the shingles in place that I've seen throughout Switzerland and northern Italy. You can see how they also cha uh, channel the waters. Uh, you see that in Peru and the Inca cultures. They were really great technicians on channeling waters and sewers you know, a thousand years ago, but here in the mountains of Bhutan, it's uh, using the water and um, channeling it. Here we see men um, preparing the fields in the spring to plant potatoes. Art, can you give me any idea of the, the age of some of these structures? Well, um, uh, th 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 there's no question that uh, that Zong in the background in this image, that's the monastery. It'll go back easily 500 years uh, to 1,000 years. And, you know, they'll keep re- uh, reshoring up the walls and things like that, but that structure more than likely has been there for a thousand years, and so probably. Just, yeah, so I mean, it, about modern technology of of uh, uh, steel components and uh, and concrete, and these are all uh, uh, locally uh, uh, sourced materials. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I interrupted. You were going to say. 
Well, I was going to just say that the the cold, I mean, they build very strong structures because during the winter months, of course, you've got snow. This is around 10 to 11,000 feet in the uh, foothills of the Himalayas, and peaks will go up to 25,000 feet uh, above. And so it's a cold environment. In the spring, it's, it's comfortable. It's in the 70s. Uh, the buildings are both cool in the summer and warm in the winter. And again, the main source of uh, fuel and heat would be burning yak dung or wood. And so, uh, and as I said earlier, it's illegal, by the way, just to cut a tree in Bhutan. So you have to petition the government if you want to cut down a tree. And that's why the forests are very much intact in Bhutan. You see old growth forest of fir, cedar, spruce. Many of the trees you would see in the Cascades here in Washington State, you see very close cousins in Bhutan. And the, the, the homes that they live in, uh, will dry uh, grains in the rafters. Uh, the animals might be brought into the lowest level. So everything kind of goes into one structure, and the main floor would be the living quarters where they'd have, you know, a family and maybe even the parents, uh, the grandparents would live with the grandchildren. So this keeps the precipitation out but allows the airflow to go through, and that helps to... Uh, uh, deal with drying out the, the grain products and so forth, but it also provides uh, an adequate ventilation. Pretty amazing, huh? It really is. And you can see in this image rocks atop the, the sh uh, wood shingles. Uh, a lot of wind comes through the mountains. And you can see woven uh, matting is part of their um, uh, the wall in this particular case. And are these extended families then that would live in these uh, structures, I assume? That's right. You would see grandparents uh, um, and grandchildren in the same place. And maybe uh, uh, brothers and sisters might share a building. And some of the structures are very small, but very tidy, very clean. See prayer flags built around. Prayer flags are part of the culture that, uh, that you would find not only in uh, Bhutan, but Nepal. Uh, Tibet. Uh, it's basically a Buddhist tradition of inscribing Buddhist prayers on very delicate fabric. And so as the wind buffets the fabric, the, the fabric disintegrates, thus releasing the uh, prayers to the heavens. Now we're in uh, Namibia, one of the driest deserts on the planet. These are the Himba people. And the structures are much more uh, primitive because there's just so little, as you see around there. They they have herds of goats, and the goats are everything for the people. You know the sustenance. They even use the goat dung to plaster the roof of the the huts that they built with skins and mud and dung. And they gather up the the wood from the few rivers that are in the area. There'll be some forests. You know, very small shrubs and trees that they'll use the wood. And that wood will be used again and again and again because it's such a precious commodity. Indeed. So we see a very yeah. different housing type. Uh, and, and in this particular case, um, do you have any, any feel for how long uh, these people would occupy this particular spot? Uh, you know, I think that they are basically going to be in this area forever the, because uh, they are locked into this particular valley, and over the next ridge would be another valley with another uh, small uh, uh, collection of um, extended families. And I just uh, they're not very migratory. They basically uh, make ends meet in a valley like this. So that structure would be built and rebuilt and rebuilt over you know, time, but they're not picking up and moving across the landscape. If there is a, uh, an image of finite resources, this must be it. It is. Uh, one of the, I mean, these people are very uh, unique in the way they dress, and they cover their skin with an ochre from uh, the clay of the bank. So everything's orange about them, and uh, they mix the mud with the oil from, um, you know, cooking meat and the oil that they collect from that, they'll mix with the mud and cover their bodies for protection from the relentless sun. 
They'll get into the hut during the heat of the day to uh, survive, and then in the evening they're, or the afternoon and in the mornings they're out. So that, that structure is really uh, protection from the sun and the heat, and uh, everybody gets in one little hut. I mean, they'll have three or four huts, and there could be like 40 people in the village. So it's a, We're it's not a, talking, uh, it, it's not a large civilization. There's not tens of thousands of people in Namibia uh, that are Himba. There's maybe hundreds and hundreds of people spread out over a vast area. So when we think of the, the basic need of shelter and security, we're looking at it. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm speaking specifically because I thought the, uh, uh, your audience would be interested on how different cultures really have adapted to their environment. I'm staying often when I travel in lodges that are embracing the, the what you are all about, you know, using uh, the the climate, the, the resources in a very smart way. And you see now uh, most areas that I travel, the, the, the lodges incorporating solar panels and collecting water and, uh, you know, it, it's just become a mantra across the planet. I have not traveled in the last couple of years without being reminded over and over again to uh, the water is the key. Don't waste it. Don't, you know, don't overuse what you've got. So it's, it's, it's pretty interesting how over the last 15 years everything's changed and, uh, and changed for the good in terms of, um, wisely using what we've got. Uh, and and just to reflect back in Bhutan, you see uh, people collecting garbage along the way, and they are very, very clean, as are the people in Burma. There's uh, They banned using plastic bags about five or six years ago in Burma because it was becoming a problem. So a lot of the... Uh, environmental awareness that we're seeing here in America, you see across the planet. It's, it's probably the most important element in preserving diversity, not only among uh, human populations, but in, in all populations of the world, it seems to me. Yeah, yeah. Tell here us we're, about... Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, tell us about this image. This is, uh, these are uh, beautiful little structures made in the de uh, the mountains uh, uh, on the border of the Sudan and Ethiopia. These are little goat homes. <laughs> and and they uh, look actually better built than the houses that the, the people, the Surma or the Karo, the Mercy, the Hammer, these are all unique different tribes that live in and around the Omo River and the mountains that rise above. And so these are, each one of these uh, are little homes for goats, and they'll get up in there and uh, live at night. And uh, the homes themselves are larger structures that are uh, with ribs of trees, and then they're covered with grasses. And so these are just a few of the shots that I pulled from my files to show you how, again, different uh, areas of the world have different structures, but they're all built with uh, materials you know, that are not too far from where they live. This is a very, you can see how the uh, ribs of this structure is tied together. This is not too unlike the little huts that I used to make in West Seattle when I made camps in the forest. And they would cover it. These, these look very sturdy, Art. I, I assume that this is protection from predators? This is largely protection. Uh, no, there, you know, there are lions, there are leopards in the greater area, but for the most part, Part, it's just protection from the elements and uh, and rain. You know, when the rains come to Ethiopia, it's heavy, and so they they don't have a lot. They don't wear a lot of uh, clothes. They've got skins from the goats, and pretty much, you know, they're uh, they don't have a lot of warm clothes. And so this structure will uh, keep them dry when the rains come and warm at night in the desert air, you know, the radiational cooling is quite profound. And so the temperatures could drop into the uh, 50s, which would, for them, would be very cold. 
this is another structure in uh, Mali, in the sub, uh, in the Saharan country of Mali. You have a lot of heat of the uh, the desert, and so the the material by cho uh, choice is adobe, and so the largest adobe structures on Earth are in Mali, and they uh, is a Islamic country, so they have very large mosques, and then their homes are made out of adobe as well, and so you can see how they ventilated uh, the the building to release the air or to have air, air cooling. The wood that's embedded in the walls are basically ladders that they will climb on the outside to reapply clay after the monsoon season. So if, if they didn't have the um, wood embedded into the wall, they simply wouldn't be able to reapply the clay because the structures are so steep. So it's a beautiful uh, um, architecture. And within some of the larger mosques, you can see the columns made out of uh, Adobe, and then you can see that there's a lot of air that would channel air currents through the building. So this is inside a mosque where men would come in and kneel and pray during their um, prayer sessions. In that same country, the Dogon people live in the mountains. And they have one of the most beautiful structures I've seen with thatched roofs and, again, adobe walls. Some of these buildings you're looking at are small granaries to dry the grain and keep them uh, away from rodents that would uh, eat their food. And here the Dogon people are crushing the uh, the millet or the grain. I think I've just went through a couple of slides really quick there. But anyway, you can see how beautiful these structures are. And on the roof, they dry their grains. Is that now, beautiful? It is it's incredibly fascinating. I, I, you know, the diversity of, of these different cultures is really coming through. I'm going to let you continue through this. We have about a, a quarter of an hour uh, left in, in, our, okay. uh, in our time here, but I wanted to see uh, if um, perhaps Mike has a, uh, a specific question uh, presented by someone in attendance that he might want to uh, uh, share with us. Uh, I don't have any at the moment. I kind of wanted to to let Art continue on his on his pictorial. I think tour I here. have just a few. Uh, let's see. I'm on. I've got 49 of 67. I'll wrap this up so we can have a a, a broader conversation. So, All right. yeah. So these uh, again, just to finish up the the showing of how the uh, Dogon people live in these mountains and they uh, they grow grain. And this is just a shot of one of the ceremonies the Dogon people do during the harvest season. We're going to jump into Vietnam. We're going to go into Halan Bay, which is on the ocean. It's a very uh, steep, uh, walled, karst mountain landscape. And here, the people live an aquatic life. There is no uh, a land that they can walk on. So the structures that they build are on floating logs from which they'll build their villages. So everything is floating. Dogs that they uh, own, and there's a lot of dogs in the villages, never set foot on land. So the children move from structure to structure on boats. They harvest the bounty from the sea, but it's a very different lifestyle, as you can see. So. Water is collected in drums. Uh, let me go back to that. You can see the drums collect the water. So there's a, and it rains a lot. So they trap the water in drums. They reuse it. Uh, I can see in this image, um, the drums keep the uh, homes afloat. And then they have a structure of wood that um, is supporting the house. So that's a pretty interesting culture. Uh, it's almost like the old uh, Costner movie called Water World. I've never seen quite something like that. But similar to that in northern Myanmar is a very large lake in, uh, called Inlay Lake. And here the, the land is uh, very marshy. So uh, the houses are built on stilts. And there's a lot of channels uh, between the houses. So people, again, get around on boats. And uh, then they'll go out on the lake. And you can see in the center, there's a kind of a thimble-shaped net. And uh, those nets are how they catch the fish. So people move through these villages 
and here a man is going to take his net, go out into the main lake, and fish. And so they just drop the thimble-shaped nets over fish in a very shallow lake, and that's how they uh, basically survive, is from the fish that they catch. And oh, oh, please go ahead. And I think there's just a couple more, a couple last-minute photos. Out from their village to the only well in the region. So everything that these women collect, all the water that they put in that one vessel will sustain their family for that day. And the next morning, they're back out over the sand dunes collecting the water. So they're very judicious on how they use the water, but they'll have you know their children, their husband, the cooking, all will be contained in that one big vessel of water that they, they collect. I think that may be it for my little presentation this morning. Another of your magical images. I, uh, I I'm really uh, struck by the fact that you know, even with all the diversity of these different kinds of uh, of uh, societies and so forth, that there's a common thread of um, a certain resource management and stewardship that takes place. Most of these, if not all of them, are uh, cultures that have been in place for many, many generations, uh, un unlike, you know, in our own country, we're, we're fairly young in the scheme of things. And, and yet we see um, th that cultures all around the world that are not uh, even perhaps aware of one another uh, have this same ethic of stewardship. Is, is, is that something that, that you find? You know, I think it's based on survival. When you have uh, limited resources, you evolve a culture that sustains you um, you know the if, if if this particular tribe that we ended with these people out in Rajasthan had an abundance of water that they would probably be a little more callous on how they use it but since there's so little water they make that little water go a long way one of the most striking things I can remember is when I was back in the Yanomamo tribe that that uh, the people that we started off with in the slideshow, I gave a power bar to uh, a collection of kids that were surrounding me and watching me photograph. There was probably 11 kids, and I gave one of the kids a power bar, and he took the power bar and broke it into 11 different pieces so that every one of those kids had an equal share. When you live in a hunter-gatherer community, whatever the successful hunter catches or shoots, everybody shares in that, and that's the survival of the village. And so you see that over and over again, how people learn to live within the means of what they've got. And I think that in our culture, we're learning. We're learning to that water is not in infinite amount. I think uh, that we learned and we are learning fast that we've got to be much more prudent on how we build our buildings and warm our buildings and that's the encouraging things we live in a uh, in a society where technology is advancing and we're adapting and you're in the forefront of that so it, you know it's just something that I, I relish I mean I I just think that we've got to do this it has to be an inspiration to you in your own life. You were um, uh, telling me previously that um, your next trip is going to take you to Europe, uh, and you have a month of travels there, and you said that it's bookended by a couple of uh, very special presentations that you've been invited to give? Well, actually, no. I'm actually, I just rented out the Royal Geographic Society Hall in London. I've my books have been published in Europe for the last 20 years, so I have a, a pretty strong uh, connection with the people in England and Germany and Italy. And so I go there and I give talks and teach composition, and we'll we'll do that. And so and I I will be giving talks in the future in Asia. It, it's kind of a, a an interesting thing now in the age of the internet that. Uh, 
whatever we post on our website, you know, people from Rome and people from Thailand and other parts of the world are cluing in at the same time. So it's, it's become a very small world with that in mind. And so when I travel, I connect with the people. I see. Okay. And um, I, and you said that you were going to also be um, visiting the Alps, you said, this fall. and. Yeah, I, I we we do about five different large wall calendars with European countries, and so it, uh, you know you cannot do a mountain calendar without having some of the Alps represented, as well as the Himalaya, the Andes, and other great ranges. So uh, it's time to go back to Europe to teach a couple of workshops and to photograph new places. I mean that's what I do all the time is I travel around the globe. This year alone, I've been all across Australia and South Africa teaching workshops. I started the year in Tanzania, Zanzibar, Uganda, and Rwanda. I've got trips, and, I, and uh, two weeks ago, I was photographing jaguars uh, along a river in Brazil. And so it's an interesting life. For one week, I could be doing a remote culture, the next a beautiful landscape, and the next uh, a stunning animal in a forest. You know, Art, I could count on one hand the people in the world uh, that I'm aware of who I have an envy for their job. And I, uh, I, I think I probably share that with uh, everyone who's listening today. It must be one of the most rewarding um, lives uh, that, I've, that I've ever um, been exposed to. Well, you know, the older, and thank you for that, the older I've gotten, the more I appreciate that I have been blessed with health and energy and drive. I, I recognize that a lot of people have, do not have the economy or the health to travel to the places I've been. And I, I see that as a huge mission to share what I've seen with people that would not be able to get there. And so um, it's truly one of my main uh, focuses is to share what I've learned over the years with other people to inspire them to teach them what I've learned in photography so it's it's just being a good part of society I, I believe well you you do it so masterfully um, uh, Mike uh, do you have uh, any questions that have uh, come in from our viewers or are they so stunned that they they're unable to uh, <laughs> provide a question no we, we do have a couple so I wanted to make sure I got those two uh, to art um, the first question is going to be, what can what can we in Western civilization learn from these indigenous cultures in terms of resource use? I think it's it's obvious. It's it's to live within our means to to look at how you're living and you know over what was it 20 years ago we all started recycling or hearing about recycling, and I think people genuinely feel good when they know they're. Um, being careful on what they use and what they waste and how they, you know, recycle. I think we pretty much are getting it. I mean, there are parts of this country probably that are lagging behind in recycling or on water usage. But I think as we see in this calendar year with the great drought that's over two-thirds of our country, I think people are becoming, they're, they're becoming aware on the value of water and how to turn off the water when you're not using it, how to turn lights off when they're not using, how to use more energy efficient bulbs rather than, you know, the standard light that we've been using for the last 50 years. So I think everybody's cluing in as we feel more and more stressed by climate change. It's going to point the way that we've got to be better users of the natural resources around us. Uh, we got another question from Sarah. This this question uh, speaks to kind of your observations. Uh, when we're talking about the indigenous cultures, um, do you feel that they are stewards of their surroundings, or are are even they exhausting their environments? I think that uh, the humans are humans, and I think many of these cultures became stewards out of necessity. You know, in other words, they they weren't just born. You know. Um, sensitive to the environment. It's just that out of survival needs, they became very, very careful on how they use their resources. But as 
everybody's evolving. You know, man and cultures and our intellect are constantly advancing. They now, and to give you a perfect example, I said it earlier, the Bhutanese now are teaching their children to pick up after themselves and not to waste, not to throw away garbage, to clean up, not to throw things in the river that the very water they're going to use. I think everybody is cluing into those kind of things. When Vietnam is, uh, you know, the the problem is like uh, the villagers in Vietnam that live on the water, they historically would throw debris into the water and that debris would break down naturally. But now in the age of modern plastics, that plastic is just going out into the uh, currents and contributes to that great gyre uh, out there in the middle of the North Pacific, you know, that vast sea of plastic, a lot of that is coming out of Asia, out of Vietnam, China, Japan. In Myanmar, they banned the plastic. They banned that kind of plastic that doesn't break down. In Washington State here, we or in Seattle, we banned using plastic grocery bags. And so I think that's going to be part of an overall trend that we're going to see, but it's also happening in other parts of the world. I've got a question for you, Art, and we've got another one I see too. Um, not being familiar with your 60 plus books, um, I'm, I'm going to apologize for my ignorance there, but um, have you uh, ever taken pictures of locations, uh, you know, relatively recently that you took pictures of early in your career and compared the, the changes of the, the environments or the habitats, the the animal uh, population, um, has that ever been a project of yours, uh, published or, or otherwise? There have been other colleagues of mine that have documented uh, glaciers five years ago and glaciers today and how, and they've actually done it with time lapse showing how the glaciers are receding in Greenland. Jim Baylog comes to mind. I've seen changes. I've not been back to Lhasa, but you could not get the photographs that I photographed in Lhasa in the winter of 1984 where the Patala, Patala Palace, which is the heart of the Buddhist culture in Tibet, was surrounded by cow pastures. Today, it looks like a modern Chinese city, and one of the reasons I, I don't really want to go back and destroy my memory of something that was great. I have not specifically tried to document the before and the after, um, but I can tell you that it's not all bad. I mean, it's not, 20 years ago wasn't the, the shining example uh, in our country, you know, Seattle before uh, in the 70s and the 80s was very polluted compared to Seattle today. Uh, Seattle in the uh, 60s never had the eagles. You know, they were pretty much uh, dwindling because of DDT. And now in most Seattle parks, you see nesting pairs of bald eagles. So there's, you know, the, uh, I often give this out to my audience that, Nature is resilient if given a fighting chance. So all the comparatives wouldn't naturally be o only heading in one direction. It's interesting that uh, nature reclaims environmental areas. If you don't um, build constantly on a piece of land, if it's abandoned, it's, fat, it's easily reclaimed by nature. So it, it would be interesting to kind of do a reverse of what the obvious would be, which is to go back to places that were once cultivated and now abandon and see the before and the after. We have a question from a gentleman named Jeffrey, and he asks, if there's anything you've learned through your travels about sustainable practices that you've personally integrated into either your personal life or your photography. Well, certainly in, uh, in my personal life, I have become much more um, careful on how I try to buy local uh, produce wherever I can. I, those are the things that immediately come to mind. Okay. And the last question that we've got for today is, um, what do you feel it will take to get both the U.S. and other Western cultures to become better stewards, like the, some of the examples that you have shown, other than potentially a, a cataclysmic climate event? Well, you know, I, I, 
I often wonder why we don't listen to scientists that have been telling us these things for the last, you know, 30 years. I think part of it is the fault of the scientists. They they do the research. They know a lot of the answers, but they don't. Their voices are often uh, kind of overshadowed by l loud politicians. And I'm waiting for the next Carl Sagan to come along that's charismatic, that's politically shrewd, but that's also got the knowledge. I think in Western culture, we want to be led, and it often takes a very charismatic person to lead us. I think that overall, people are learning, but it seems inordinately slow. We, we, we listen to sound bites, and often we listen to people that are saying things we want to hear, and it's often at odds with the reality. And so climate is changing, whether we, you know, and it's, in, it's obvious to me that man has impacted that. How could we not with billions of people on the planet? I think people just have to listen to what's being said, and we need better speakers. We need more charismatic leaders to, to show the way. Thank you, Mike, and, and, and Art, thank you so much. I, you know, I have to say that um, when, whenever I'm asked about people that I truly admire and I appreciate, uh, one of the folks who comes to mind time after time for me is, is Jacques Cousteau. And it's, it's not just the fact that he was such a, a, a great explorer and that he mastered and, in fact, invented much of the technology that allowed him to explore the undersea world and so forth. But it was the fact that through his images and through his words and his communication, he was able to bring the undersea world to me right in my own living room. And I think that that's an incredible gift um, that I will always cherish. I just want to say that um, your images and your travels uh, allow us to vicariously enjoy so much beauty, and I, I am so um, much an admirer of the way uh, you construct and frame uh, an image as well as the way you describe it. And so I, I just want to thank you again for joining us. And uh, I, you know, I'm thinking about the fact that NASA successfully landed uh, uh, on Mars, you know, uh, early Monday morning, and, and I'm just thinking that when they when they uh, select a photographer to go and take those pictures, I hope it's you. Ron, you're a very kind man, and thank you so much for the compliments. And like you, I was a big fan of uh, Jacques Cousteau as well. Well, I think that's it for this week, and I'll let Mike uh, sign off for us. But uh, again, Art, thank you, and we'll look forward to every image that you uh, share. Thank you so much. Well, I, yeah, I wanted to take one more opportunity to thank our sponsors, which were BASF, Bio-Based Insulation, DuPont, Green Builder Coalition, and Upanor. And I also wanted to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, Ryan, I saw you had a question come in afterwards, and I will make sure to pass that along to Art. Um, thank you to Jeffrey and Sarah for asking their questions as well. And finally, thank you, Art, for taking the time to share your fascinating observations and bringing the world to our computer screen today. Uh, we hope you'll join us next time for another edition of Impact Series, Game Changers in Sustainability. Thank you once again, and take care.